Welcome to Brother Owl's Garden. My name is Brian and I honor your presence here today. Today I've got my brother here, Rick. Rick is a good friend of mine for it's about six years. We know each other here in yeah, Thailand. Okay. Yeah. And oh, if we only had footage of the countless late night, several hour long, deep conversations contemplating the world and all existence that, that he and I have had together. Rick and I have covered so much in uh, deep, deep conversation that I just had to bring him here today because when it comes to today's topic, I consider Rick to be the man. And today's topic is about perfect pictures. And perfect pictures are going to be explained by Rick. So I'll open it up first, Rick, by saying, first of all, what are perfect pictures? Well, uh, let me explain a little bit how the term perfect picture came into existence. Hmm. When you're reading auras uh, and you're looking at the chakras and you see blockages in the chakras and they appear as pictures. So the word perfect picture came into existence when someone has a picture or beliefs in one of their chakras um, that can find them or um, they hold a perfect idea of the way they should be, the world should be. Um, for instance, one day I went out for dinner and I ordered enchiladas. Well, everybody knows that enchiladas are those little round corn tortillas. And what they brought me was, looked like pancakes corn tortillas stacked on one on top of the other. It's like, oh my God, what is that? And so I, that was my perfect picture, what they should be like. Okay, so I looked at them and I said, well, let's see what they taste like. Mm. Okay, so I tasted them. They were delicious. But if I'd have stuck with my perfect picture, I would have not been happy with me. So... Huh. Yeah, I, I like that example, and uh, you reminded me of um, someone who I had the honor of loving very deeply in my life, who when I first met her, I thought, you're not my type, you're not what I go for, yet I can't deny this, this overwhelming drive to absolutely go and definitely be with you, and uh, it turned out to be the most beautiful relationship that you could ever imagine yep. from somebody who wasn't my type because I had that idea. So it sounds, Rick, like you're, if, if we could squeeze it into one little ball, idealistic concepts and beliefs. Expectations. Yeah. Expectations. It's yeah. A very good, a very good, uh, so you have an expectation for the way things should be, you should be, it should be, mm. the world should be, and very often it never lives up to that. So mm. you feel mm. bad about yourself, you feel the world is wrong, you feel other people are not doing what's right, yeah. so on and so forth. So Rick, where do these perfect pictures, these idealistic ideas and expectations and, you know, well, where do they come if, from in, in our life? If, if you consider a child who comes into this life pretty much a clean slate, there are some um, things from the past that do influence mm -hmm. his decision-making ability, but most of it, most of the perfect pictures we get from society, our parents, school, mm -hmm. doctors, lawyers, the government, and we buy into them. One thing I've noticed in our energy system, if you looked at your chakras kind of like, like uh, oh, little programs, the information in them are like little programs. And we program each of our chakras. And when you look at those on an energy level, you see them as pictures. And in the aura, they, they appear as colors. So most of our perfect pictures we get from others. This is the way you're supposed to be. This is the way the world is supposed to be. This is what your enchiladas are supposed to yeah. taste like. This video was supposed to be done without lots of traffic noise and motorcycles going by every two seconds. <laughs> Well, Is that a perfect picture? That's a perfect picture. <laughs> Hope you can overlook that or, or overhear that. 
Um, so they come from programming, yep. and uh, you could say conditioning. Conditioning, conditioning programming, yes. More at a younger uh, stage of our life when we're, you know, there's an awful lot of um, layers of conditioning and programming that are piled on top of us and imbued into us at a young age where we're absolutely not aware of it. We couldn't be expected to be aware of that. And then you, you, you know, you kind of pop out of the, you kind of pop out of the stew in your, uh, oh, in your early twenties, and you start saying, what, where, what, where did that come from? How did that get in there? Another thing that another thing that uh, I found is lies stick in the chakras, and lies, lies. They the truth stick. goes right on through. You ever hear a truth, and you half hour later you're going, oh, what was that? But lies, boom, boy, they stick. And not only do we get information from other people, but we also make decisions ourselves about ourselves, about life, mm -hmm. about the way we're supposed to be. Um, like my son, when he was five, he, uh, me and my wife got divorced, and he decided it was his fault. He didn't come out and say it was his fault. So this leads us to the next point, is when you have these perfect pictures, that are stuck in your energy centers, your chakras, and they're affecting and I'm not going to say ruling your life, but they're certainly massively influencing your life. Well, they do rule. They do. You would because go that far? the subconscious always went out over ah. the conscious mind. Ah, and okay. there's an old biblical saying um, that a house divided yeah. cannot stand. Right. So you've got the subconscious going, you're no good, and you've got your conscious mind going, look at all I've accomplished. But still, you're, you're creating yeah. what your subconscious believes rather than your conscious mind. And you've caused me to remember two, two points that I'd like to add in that fit into this very well. In the Gospel of Thomas, uh, Thomas says that the Christ taught when the two become one, that's when you're whole and you ascend. Right. And it is understood to mean your, your shadow self and your conscious self, your, your unconscious and your conscious which then feeds into Carl Jung, uh, until you bring your shadow self into the light of consciousness, it will rule your life and you will call it fate. Right, and so, so yeah. what that affords you is if you look at life that way, that you create your reality, attract people, mm. places, and things to you based on your programming, subconscious, and in your chakra system, then all of life becomes an opportunity to heal and grow. And I imagine that until you do that healing and growing, what? It well, you, keeps you, coming back. You create what um, your subconscious believes. Like my, my son, I was starting to tell you, when mm -hmm. he was five, my wife and I got divorced, and on a, cer on a certain level, he decided it was his fault. Right. Okay. He didn't say that, but he started doing things like hurting himself. I mean, ended up with a trip to the emergency room of the hospital. And how old was he around that time? Five. Five. Yeah. And so uh, being aware uh, that we create things in our life, there are no accidents, um, I sat down and had a two-hour conversation with him. It took two hours to finally get him to the realization that it was his fault. Or that he believed it was his fault. He believed it was yeah. his fault. Yeah. Now, if he would have held that belief subconscious, and I would have not gone after it, and brought it out, and told him that's a lie, mm -hmm. he would have created yeah. a lot of negative things like he had been, three yeah. injuries, which he never did before. I mean, you know, occasional scrape, bruise. Well, because these things were acting out in him, Beyond his awareness, to, right. you know, he wasn't he wasn't examining them right. consciously and critically. He he was just uh, at their mercy in a way. Right. They were and they were they were causing things him to create certain things in his life, such as hurting himself. And is there? You mentioned that these uh, these lies, these these false beliefs, mm -hmm. um, in the context of calling them perfect pictures. Uh, they is it correct to say that they reside in whichever of the chakras? Is there one more than the other, or is there? Um, you can have chakras like uh, if you have a belief system, we'll say that um, 
in order to be a good person, you have to believe a certain way. Mm. And if you don't believe that way, bad things will happen. So right. that would involve more of your heart center, yeah. how you feel about yourself, and your survival chakra, first chakra. So in someone's aura, I might see very dark energy in their first chakra and maybe... Root, you mean root chakra? Root chakra, root chakra. first chakra. Yeah, it's at the prostate gland. A lot of people misplace it. And for men, it's prostate. For women, it's at the ovaries. Oh, okay. So, um, so these perfect pictures you could think of as kind of an energy mass that resides in whichever chakra resonates with that that kind of a belief. Yeah, is that safe to say yeah. that? Okay. Yeah, it's kind of like I said, it's kind of like a little computer program. You put okay, and you know, just keeps them running. And I found it interesting but, that you but, said the lies stick and yes. the truth flows through. Yes. That's. Uh, so lies are sticky. They, they get caught within us. Yes, they do. We hang yeah. on to them, we get them all over us. Yeah. Well, usually usually there's something else associated with a lie, like you have to believe a certain thing, otherwise you mm -hmm. go to a place that's very hot. Right. Okay, yeah. So that kind of makes it stick. You've got that. Death, right. I call them death pictures, because mm -hmm. death pictures. This says doom, you, doom pictures. Doom picture. It yeah. says if you don't do a certain thing, you're yeah. going to have this happen. Um, which is a lie. Yeah. And could these um, could these lies also involve? Um, pretty sure this is going to be a yes answer. Could they involve uh, beliefs of inadequacy, unworthiness? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not good enough. I don't mm -hmm. deserve it. I'm not worthy. I'm not lovable. I'm not enough. All of this kind of nonsense beliefs. That, yes, of course. Yeah. Like I'll give you an example. When I was uh, when I was five. <laughs> okay. Uh, my parents got divorced. Mm. Okay, so my mom, rather than picking me at five for her new boyfriend, picked this man that was 28 years old, big as a house, yeah. compared to me, intelligent, everything that I wasn't. And I made the decision that I wasn't good enough. It's, it's not the correct decision. It's not uh, one that was based on anything other than me comparing myself to him. And mm -hmm. that ended up not really manifesting uh, until I fell in love for the first time. And guess what I created? <laughs> I created a situ situation of course, that proved to me that I wasn't good enough. My wife, after the, night, the day after I married her, she didn't come home. And uh, that was uh, the beginning. Yeah. Uh, my inner search, my psychological processing, my meditations, uh, and it was also searching. the beginning of my drinking career, which yeah. I'm happy to say is over. <laughs> Good for that. Uh, a couple of observations about what you've just shared with us today, Rick. Um, first of all, a five-year-old who cannot be expected to know any better and cannot be expected to have any kind of skills or tools necessary for processing things and interpreting things, it's totally reasonable that a five-year-old would interpret his father and mother splitting apart and his mother entering into a relationship with another man who isn't him as having been bypassed. Why wasn't I? Dad wasn't good enough for you, but then I wasn't good enough for you. Why wasn't I good enough for you? And, and did I cause this whole debacle, mm -hmm. you know? And then what I think is even, I think there's even a little bit more insight here. And I think that it turns out to be very beautiful. Yeah, well. You, well, let me, it, let me share what it is. Mm -hmm. At age five, your parents split up and you interpreted it as being your fault and therefore you're no good. Well, I interpreted her picking someone other than me Okay. That's mean I wasn't good enough. Yeah, you're not good enough, mm -hmm. and, and it happened when your parents split up at five. Mm -hmm. But then you, at a later point in life, were able to bring that to consciousness, work on it, meditate it, do the shadow work, as they say, and bring it to a, a state of healing. Yeah. And then after you had done that... It changed the type of relationships I created. But more than that, you had a child... Mm -hmm. whose parents split up at age five and took it upon himself to blame himself for this. Yeah. But you were now 
the Rick that had healed from that exact kind of trauma. Yeah. And you were able to catch your son on the back end of it yeah. and enlighten him through his process of healing by the very process of healing that you yourself had experienced. Yeah, yeah. You, once you bring something to a conscious awareness, you automatically start processing it. But most of the time, we suppress the memories. Mm. It's kind of like the, the memory sits here, and you have an emotion that sits over the top of it. Oh. Okay. And whenever you hit, whenever something in, in life presses that button, it it brings those feelings up, and we have a tendency to resist those feelings mm. because part of it believes it's true. Right. And, and we don't want to. I mean, if I had to walk around every day of my life thinking, I'm not good enough, I'm not good enough, I'm not good enough. But what is it? What do we do? Boom, it goes into our subconscious, we suppress it. The minute we let ourselves really feel our feelings, those memories start popping up. But as long as we suppress the, the feeling, the memory stays with us also. Mm. So that's the key. Uh, and it's a very simple process. Sometimes it's very painful uh, in terms of going back into those memories, and, and most of the time we believe they're true, so we really don't want to go there. We feel threatened that our beliefs are going to be overturned or wrecked, and then, and then what? Because we, we, we made a choice unconsciously at some point in the past to accept this as true or to hang on to this, uh, even if it was unconscious. Mm -hmm. It's there. Yep. And until, again, Carl Jung, until you bring the shadow up into the light, uh, it, it will govern you and you'll call it fate. Yes. So, yeah. well, we, have, we have all kinds of uh, uh, pictures and programming. What do I have to do to be spiritual? Right. Uh, you have to have a beard. You have to have a beard, right. Uh, you have to be celibate. You have to be a vegan. You have to go to church on Sundays. Right. You have to sit in meditation for six hours a day. You have to go live in the mountain. Whatever condition you put on it is what you have to do in yeah. order to validate who you are as spirit. Yeah. And eventually what you'll find is there's a book that I had in my bookstore when I was, oh, I don't know, 32. And the title of the book I, I loved, Do I Have to Give Up Me to Be Loved by You? <laughs> okay. The question and, answers itself and it's wonderful. Yes. And what I've found was that um, in order to be accepted by our parents and people in society, we had to disconnect from ourselves as spirit. Okay? Mm. And if we don't, it's like having a friend. And every time your friend comes over, you get in trouble. Next time you see that friend coming, you're going, oh shit, I'm out of here. Mm. Uh, so Creates a pattern. Yes, and I, I call that when you go back to that place where you deny itself the connection with yourself as spirit, I call it the dark night of the soul. And when that happened to me, I woke up in the morning and I cried my eyes out all day long. Luckily, I had to go to class that evening and they plumped me down in front of somebody and I had to sit there and get my stuff together so I could go reading. <laughs> okay, but after that, after that experience, and I, I had the memories of uh, and and the decisions were coming up of where I made the decision I have to give up myself to be loved by you, to be accepted by you. The emptiness that I had felt here my whole life had gone. It was gone. It was gone. It was amazing. It washed out with all the tears. It, well, and, and also, during that whole day, I, I was processing, right. you know, what, where, what is this feeling, and where is it yeah. coming from? Yeah. And the memories started coming up, and, and as they came up, I will get into it in a few minutes, I'm sure, how to release them. Well, that brings us straight to the next question. So now, we understand what perfect pictures are. We understand where they come from in our lives, how they get into us. And we understand how they affect us when we've got them, when we're holding on to them. The obvious question, how do we heal? How do we resolve? What, what can we do to untangle and heal from 
this this phenomenon of perfect pictures. Okay, first I'd like to start out with who and what you are. You know, um, we have a tendency to identify with this body, our emotions, and this mind as who we are. Okay, when you go get in your car and drive it, are you a car? No. You're using that vehicle for a purpose. We as spirit are using this body, this mind, this emotion to express through as spirit. What happens during the course of life, we have a tendency to cut that spiritual connection, not totally off, but down. Okay, so all you have to do to get in touch with that is you don't have to do anything except let go of the condition that you have put on it through your life experience, the lies you brought into, what your society has said you need to do. What I did in my classes was do a very simple meditation. Sit quietly in a chair, close your eyes, be aware of the pressure of your body on the chair, the temperature of the air in the room, you have any aches or pains. Okay? Then be aware of the emotions that you're experiencing right now. Okay. Are you happy? Are you sad? Are you disgusted? Are you comparing yourself to a perfect picture and you're not good enough? Okay. Then watch your thoughts. What is it that's watching your thoughts? What happens to your thoughts when you start watching them? And that being, that, that uh, consciousness that's watching your thoughts is you as spirit. And it's that simple. The hard part then is getting rid of the programming that creates you, that keeps you creating what you don't want in your life. The subconscious programming, the energy in your chakra. So, what you can do is simply sit in, sit quietly in a chair, close your eyes, and start to become aware of your body. And I think. Brian uh, did a video on grounding. Grounding is number one, key. It seems so simple, but it's key to everything that you do on the energy level. When you ground, you connect with the earth. And we'll go into how you ground it. But I liken it to a battery. When you disconnect the battery cable from your car, no juice flows. Your car won't start. It won't run. So when you ground, what it does is help you as spirit come more into your body, bring more of your energy as spirit into your body, okay? And it helps them to facilitate your awareness of what's going on. Simple meditations are be aware of, of your first shot. How does that feel when you move your point of focus to your first shot? When you move your point of focus to your second shot? How does it feel? Does it feel comfortable? Uncomfortable? Like, ooh, I don't, don't want to focus there. Third chakra, power center. Fourth chakra, heart center. How do you feel about yourself? Fifth chakra, creativity and expression. Sixth chakra, clear seeing, clear blind. Seventh chakra, your own information. And as you focus in, in those different places, you'll find that most of the body chakras you don't feel very comfortable in. I would say 99% of the hundreds of students that I had do this meditation, guess where they felt the most comfortable? Right up here. Not even in their body. Okay? Because well, once you come into your body and start bringing your energy into the body, you start becoming aware of all those issues, subconscious programming, lies that you brought into, and it's not comfortable. You don't like it. But the good news is, by coming in and starting to be aware of them, you can let them go. And this is the quickest method I've ever found to doing that. Come in, be aware of the feeling there. If you don't like the feeling, like, oh, I'm not good enough, okay. What you can do is imagine releasing that energy into a road, which is what we were originally taught. But you can use a balloon and then releasing it to the universe. And it's one thing that's really interesting when you 
use your imagination, you perceive things as real. Like, imagine your favorite food and what happens when the mouth starts watering. Mm. Yeah? Uh, I, I got another one I used to use in class, like that pretty girl that's walking by. <laughs> uh, what happens? Your body starts responding, okay? As if it's real, but it's not. It's in your imagination. So you can use your imagination to release. Number one, see the energy moving from the area of your body. Imagine the energy moving from the area of your body out into that rose or balloon. Can you describe what the rose and the balloon are? What they look like and what they serve? Well, they will, they will look however you perceive things in your imagination, mm -hmm. okay? Because it's not the same for, for right. everyone. Some, some people, um, like, uh, imagine an egg frying, you know? Well, that's how seeing auras looks. That's how uh, seeing energy on an energy level looks. Mm -hmm. It's not the clearness that you would imagine for your perfect picture of how it should look. <laughs> okay, we're back to perfect picture. Yeah. And the perfect picture about what you have to do in order to be able to see or So really you're talking about um, it's, it's your process of visualizing yes. that is this ritual that leads to healing. Mm -hmm. Energy follows thought. Same thing with, when you ground. When you imagine that grounding cord going down to the center of the earth and you connecting with the planet, it automatically creates as above, so below, like your car. You know, it has a negative and a positive. So if all you're doing is you got a lot of energy up here as spirit, but you're not able to bring it into your body and express it, it's not of much value. Um, so grounding is key. It's number one key. And doing the visualization, uh, even if you don't know what it is in, that's in a particular ch chakra or you know that you're creating something in your life like not enough money, just sit and we call it blowing roses. We, we imagine that energy leaving our bodies and going out into the road. Those two things, it moves the energy out of the chakra that it's in and two, it reprograms your subconscious mind. So quickest way, you can use kundalini yoga, you can use rebirthing, both of which I've been fairly deeply involved in and had some amazing experience. But this process takes you to what would normally take years of meditation to get through in one or two years. If, if you do it one hour a day, one hour a day. That's the commitment I had to make when I started taking classes. They didn't teach me what to believe. Like, you have to. Well, uh, teacher, do we have to be a vegetarian? Hey has nothing to do with it. It has nothing to do with it. Yeah, you can find, um, regarding that particular topic, and we're not debating it, but you can find, because I've researched it, you can, you can find um, luminaries, especially in the Hindu tradition, who will adamantly insist that if you don't do it, you're screwed. And then you can search one more time and find another luminary who will tell you it's, it's just folly that, that you think that's a requirement for your enlightenment. If you want to do it, do it, but, but no. you know, perfect pictures. If you think you have to do that, so, and I know that exactly. that kind of thing will upset people and you are free to choose your own beliefs, you know. But as far as um, the simpler of the processes that you've offered, to, to, to locate and identify and visualize that energy mass of that, that lie, that, that toxic belief that we're calling perfect pictures that you're not, you're failing to live up to. And you want to visualize sort of imbuing it onto the catalyst of a rose, a, a white rose, or, your, your imaginary or a balloon, rose. something and, that will soak it up. Yes. And then let it go. You can either let the balloon go. We, we call it blowing roses. We just <sighs> explode the rose. Yeah. And then some people go, well, that's not nice, you know, destroying things. Well, destroying and creating is a natural process. Right. If you, if you had everything that you ever created in your whole life and you hadn't let go of it, oh. my, my room would be uh. full of childhood drawings. Yeah, <laughs> you know? we, we are like baskets and the water runs through us. We, we don't really ever have it. It's just 
in our in our care for a time, and then it flows through the same. So I, I think, Rick, that we've covered um, quite a bit today, and I want to thank you very much and personally. Thank you, brother, yes. for may I, participating. May I add one thing? Oh, of course. Okay. Yeah. One thing I, I found is very important, and a lot, of, a lot of teaching don't teach it direct. And one thing I will say uh, about the, the Bible is it has a very direct way of transmitting and trying. Okay? And you reap what you sow. But what do they teach? Forgiveness. Forgiveness of others and yourself. Okay? But true forgiveness. How many times has you known somebody, oh, it's all right, don't worry about it, and they hold it. Okay? They hold the grudge and it comes out later. And how many times have you done it? And I done it. Okay? So true forgiveness only comes through understanding and taking responsibility for your part in the creation, the dance that you created doing with that other person. Mm. And once you do that, you remove that aspect of karma, cause and effect. Karma, dharma. You reap what you sow. And uh, it's, an, it's an amazing process, and I can only... Um, Say that I hope you have enjoyed this video. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all for watching and absorbing what we're sharing, the insights uh, that Rick has so selflessly offered for us today to benefit us, and we hope that it is meaningful and useful. And again, the the ever divine quality of forgiveness shows up again. Uh, this. In this episode, forgiveness as a canceler of karma. It neutralizes bad karma. So you can't forgive too much. Just, re just remember, and this dawned on me one time my, my teacher brought me in and said, well, Rick, you haven't been living up to your commitment of one hour of processing meditation, whatever you'd like to call it every day, and I, I, I sat there and I was dumbfounded, and I said, well, you know, Frank, you know, I've done the best I could. And what I realized is we all do the best we can with what we've been given, what we have. And therefore, uh, look at all, all of life as an opportunity to heal, to change, to grow. Well, as it's been said, uh, whatever happens is the path. <laughs> yeah. How can you fall off? You, there is no off the path. There I don't want to no get too much path. into that because that's another episode. Yeah, well, it's true. <laughs> yep. But uh, thank you all for viewing today and for stopping by again. Brother Owl's Garden, I'm Brian, and this has been our guest speaker, our first guest speaker, Rick Kenyon. And I, I honor you and I thank you for your presence and your and, offering. And here thank today. you thank for you. having me. Uh, the opportunity to share with your viewers is is uh, a dream come true. Well, I love uh, to share information and help people grow and change. And well, maybe maybe we'll uh, scare up another video. We'll see what happens in the future. Yeah. Yep. Hey, maybe we'll do a series on how to develop your uh, the ability to read or something. Uh huh. Something that I don't know how to do. So I would be I would be the first student in front of you. But we'll leave it there for for now. And uh, thank you all again. And always remember to abide in thankfulness for your highest good in the most benevolent outcome of the divine will.